Hello everyone and welcome to Quick Med, where medicine is explained quickly and easily. Today we will be discussing the hyperbilirubinemia questions which were attached to the end of the last video. If you have not seen that video yet, please go ahead and watch that first and let's get to it. So for question number one, we have an 18-year-old girl who was brought to the emergency department 30 minutes after her mother found her unconscious next to an empty bottle of acetaminophen. So here we're dealing with a drug overdose. Her serum acetaminophen concentration is significantly increased. Treatment with activated charcoal and acetylcysteine is initiated. Approximately 48 hours later, the patient develops jaundice and her serum AST activity is 4000. Which of the following best explains the jaundice in this patient? Alright, so in this question, we're dealing with a Tylenol overdose or an acetaminophen overdose. And so if we think about whether this is prehepatic, intrahepatic, or posthepatic, this is going to be an intrahepatic cause of jaundice because we have liver damage from the Tylenol. The correct answer choice here is actually B, decreased bilirubin conjugation, but let's go through the different answer choices and see why. Let's start with answer choice A, which is activation of biliverdin reductase. If you remember from our previous diagram, this enzyme is responsible for heme breakdown, which is derived from hemoglobin, and these are situations that we would get with something like hemolytic anemia, and this is a prehepatic cause of jaundice. And so this would not fit the picture represented with here, and so A is incorrect. Answer choice C is decreased generation of urobilinogen. If you remember, urobilinogen is actually formed in the intestine through the help of bacteria that is found there. We would get decreased generation of urobilinogen if there was some sort of blockage that would not allow conjugated bilirubin to reach the intestine. And so this answer choice is trying to get at a post-hepatic cause of jaundice, and so this is why it is incorrect. Answer choice D here is increased hemolysis, and this would be incorrect because we know that there is acute liver damage rather than an acute hemolytic anemia in this case. And so this is also incorrect because it is referring to a prehepatic cause as well. And finally, answer choice E, increased serum glutathione concentration, is incorrect because it should actually read as decreased serum glutathione concentration. But let's discuss this a little further to understand why. When Tylenol is ingested in the body, it is actually broken down through the CYP450 system into a toxic metabolite known as NAPKI. And this metabolite can actually lead to acute hepatic necrosis. However, with the help of glutathione, NAPKI is converted into non-toxic metabolites. But in the case of an overdose, a lot of that NAPKI is being converted into non-toxic metabolites, and so our glutathione stores get depleted. As a result of this, that NAPKI accumulates in the body, leading to liver damage. And so as you can see, in the case of a Tylenol overdose, glutathione actually gets depleted, and so the answer choice was incorrect because it said there would be an increased concentration of glutathione. But even if you are not aware of this pathway, just by understanding the cause of the jaundice and where it's occurring, whether it's prehepatic, intrahepatic, or posthepatic, you can reach the correct answer choice. All right, let's move on to question number two. Two days after undergoing surgery, a 25-year-old man develops jaundice. He has no fever, nausea, vomiting, or any abdominal pain. His physical exam is unremarkable except for mild scleral icterus. Labs are as shown below. Hemoglobin is 16.2, which is normal. Total bilirubin is 3.7, which is elevated because it's above 1. Direct bilirubin is 0.3, which is normal, and this basically tells us that this is an indirect hyperbilirubinemia. Alkaline phosphatase is 36, which is normal. AST is 15 and ALT is 12, which are both normal. And LDH is 122, which is also normal. So it's important to understand why you are given these values. The alkaline phosphatase is normal, and if you recall, alkaline phosphatase is usually elevated in the case of a cholestasis, or some sort of blockage of biliary drainage. This would indicate a more post-hepatic cause of jaundice, typically, and so this is normal, indicating that's probably not the case. The LDH is also given to us, and if you remember, LDH is actually found within the red blood cells itself. So if LDH is elevated, this is often something that we see in the case of a hemolytic anemia, where red blood cells are getting broken down and releasing LDH into the bloodstream. This is also normal, telling us that this is less likely due to some sort of anemia. And we can also be more certain of that because the hemoglobin is also normal. So you might think what's left is an intrahepatic cause of jaundice, so that must be what it is. However, if we look at the bilirubin, we have an indirect hyperbilirubinemia here. And let's look at the question a little further. We have a young male who's otherwise healthy and had just recently undergone surgery, which could be a little bit of a stress. 
He otherwise really has no other symptoms and his exam is normal. This question is referring to something called Gilbert syndrome, which we talked about before, which is where you have decreased UDP glucuronal transferase activity, impairing the liver's ability to conjugate bilirubin appropriately. This leads to hyperbilirubinemia, which is what we see here, and so the correct answer choice is going to be choice D. And another thing to keep in mind is that the AST and the ALT were also normal here, which is typically something you would not see in an intrahepatic cause of jaundice. All right, on to our final question. A 70-year-old man is brought to the emergency department by his son because of a two-day history of right upper quadrant abdominal pain, chills, and confusion. He has vomited twice during this time despite decreased food intake. Vital signs are a temperature of 104.4 degrees Fahrenheit, so he has a fever, a pulse of 110, respirations of 18, and a blood pressure of 100 over 60. Abdominal examination discloses tenderness to palpation over the liver without guarding. Results of lab studies are shown. He has a white blood count of 16,500, which is elevated, an amylase of 350, which is also elevated, and a total bile of 2.1, which is elevated. An abdominal ultrasound shows multiple stones in the gallbladder and a common bile duct measuring 9 millimeters in diameter, which indicates that it's enlarged. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? So here we have a post-hepatic cause of jaundice, as we can tell from the gallbladder stones and the enlarged common bile duct. And when we look at this question, we see that we have a patient presenting with fever, jaundice, and right upper quadrant pain. And this is actually a triad known as Charcot's triad. And this is something that we see in cholangitis, which is where you have an obstruction of the biliary duct, which is what we see here, as well as a superimposed bacterial infection, leading to signs and symptoms like right upper quadrant pain, fever, and an elevated white blood count. These patients can actually be very sick, and it's important that they receive treatment promptly because it can become life-threatening if treatment is delayed. So considering this, our correct answer choice here is C, cholangitis. When trying to answer any of these questions, just make sure that you piece things together and that things make sense to you when you're arriving at your final diagnosis. For instance, with this last answer choice, many people might have chosen A, acute cholecystitis, because they saw the gallstones on the ultrasound. However, you're also presented with an enlarged bile duct as well as fever in this patient, and so a cholangitis would fit this presentation much more so than cholecystitis. All right, everyone, I hope you found this helpful. If so, please make sure to like and subscribe to our channel so that we can keep doing what we're doing. And as always, good luck studying, everyone.